Hey, this morning you'll find in your bulletin there's something that's called SOAP. Um, we want to encourage you throughout the calendar year of 2018 uh, to follow along in this devotional. And you may have your own Bible study. That's great. Go for that. But if you're like looking for something new, we're going to do this together. And if you want to just pull that out of your bulletin just for a moment, a SOAP stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. How many know that you should probably use SOAP most every day, or at least every other day? We trust so. This will help you to remember. This is kind of one of the basics of your daily schedule where you should use SOAP. So we want you to take the Scripture, obviously read it. Uh, maybe you like to write it out. That will help you remember that. And then observation. What's it saying to the people of then? What's it saying to us now? And then application. What am I going to do about this kind of a thing? And then certainly pray. Pray God's word. And then on the other side of that, you'll see a schedule. Uh, it's not going like chronologically or anything like that or in order through scripture. It's a little bit here and there. So just a little bit something for you. So every month we will have this. It's also on our website. Uh, we just want to encourage you to do that and be kind of fun to maybe be on the same page going through some of the same scriptures throughout the calendar year. So... Well, when it's 25 below zero in Minnesota, how many know that's the point that landlords finally turn on the heat? You know that? It's also when we have really probably the last cookout of the season. At 25, I, I just, I grilled this last week, so, you know. Um, these are corny dad jokes that my kids just love, all right? So you need to hear those, though. And it's fun to see your kids starting to use those as they get older. Uh, they say, oh, boy, I'm turning into dad already, so... It was so cold, we had to stop eating with metal cutlery. Some people walked around for days with spoons or forks stuck to their tongues. How many have ever had your, your tongue stuck to some metal in the middle of winter? I watched my brother do that on a dare. And he was stuck really good until mom went and got some really warm water and got him off that, that metal. So uh, when I went for a walk today, it was so cold, hitchhikers were holding up pictures of thumbs. It was so cold, the squirrels in the park were throwing themselves at the electric fence. So, two men were meeting on the street. One said, man, it, this was a very cold morning. Well, how cold was it? I don't know exactly, but I saw a lawyer with his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> Any lawyer? Uh, Heidi, you okay with that? All right, no. <laughs> so, just a few to just have my kids talk about how bad they were, so. Well, as we close out 2017, for many of you, it was the best year ever. You're like, yeah, I can't hardly top that, but I'm going to try. And for some of you, you are like ready to say good riddance to 2017. It is time to move on. We all know that life has this way of throwing us a curveball or a changeup. Things happen that we perceive to be as negative, and we wonder, well, why me? What am I doing wrong? We can find ourselves pretty down in the dumps. Maybe even getting a little irritated at people or perhaps even angry at God. At the end of the one year and the beginning of another, we often hear about how it's a, it's a great time to start over, to turn a new leaf, a new page in the calendar. We hear about this being a time to forget the things that have happened that seem to be negative and move on. And I've said that myself. But as I think more about it, I'm not sure that we should forget all of those things. For me, they have all been great learning experiences. I don't want to forget every negative bad thing that's happened to me. Because I recognize it's often through those situations that God uses them to really shape my life a lot. And so just to forget those probably isn't a good thing for me. Now, I don't want to have them hold on to me and become negative things, but I need to learn from some of those things that have happened in my life. Sometimes we get so down because we think anything that we perceive as a bad or negative experience is definitely not a part of God's plan. If it's negative, if it's bad, it's not a part of God's plan. I want to show you a picture of this face here, and uh, I want you just to look at that. For how many of you the picture is, the guy is looking at you? Raise your hand. He's looking at you. For how many of you the guy is looking to the side? To me like, oh, yeah, I, I just, how many of you can see both? All right. Is there anyone that can't see both? 
You're just seeing one or the other. Sometimes that's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Perspective can be everything when it comes to our situations. Now, I, I want you to imagine this morning, you can take that picture off now. I want you to imagine this morning that there's a painting in front of you. And from what you can tell, it's just a small painting with a lot of material that is surrounding the picture. And as you are looking at this painting, it looks like it's something that is like really bad, kind of like depressing, perhaps even scary as you look at it. And you think to yourself, man, I don't like this. It's time to move on to something a little bit more cheerful. And no sooner do you think that to yourself when the artist that created this picture walks up to you and suddenly removes the material that surrounds that small, depressing little picture. And suddenly you recognize that there's more to the picture than what you thought. There's a lot more to it. And as you step back, and as you look at the entire picture, your perspective totally changes. You see the big picture, and it now makes you smile. You have one of those aha moments, and think to yourself, man, how did that change? Seeing the whole picture totally changes what I thought about it. You see, so often in life, our perspective is so small compared to what God sees. We know he sees the big picture, but we don't often think about that. We think about our narrow little perspective on life. We see such a minuscule part of, uh, of a time, whereas God sees the whole scene. And what we perceive to be as negative totally changes when we begin to see God's whole picture that he's drawing out before us. Now this morning, I wanna share with you a few stories of real people, one of them coming from scripture, and two of them really kind of modern day people that illustrate really about perspective and about what about when bad things happen to us? How do we respond in the midst of those things? And do we blame God for those things? Or do we recognize maybe it's even a part of God's plan of what he is doing in our life? So I want to share with you a story about a guy named Joseph. Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. And in, his story is found in Genesis chapter 37 to 50. And as a 17-year-old shepherd, Joseph is maybe a little bit of a, of a tattletale. Anybody have a sibling that's a tattletale? If you raise your hand, you're kind of a tattletale too, maybe. I, right? All right. Just setting you up there for that one. Well, he's bringing this bad report about his brothers to their father. And this behavior combined with Jacob's overt favoritism towards Joseph causes his older brothers to resent him to the point of hatred. And because of Jacob's open love for Joseph, his favoritism was begrudged by his other sons. And when Jacob presented Joseph with this highly decorated coat, he was hated and resented by his brothers all the more. To make matters worse, Joseph begins relating his dreams, prophetic visions showing Joseph one day ruling over his family. Now, the animosity towards Joseph peaks when his brothers plot to kill him in the wilderness. Reuben, though the eldest, objects outrightly to this murder. And so instead, the brothers sell Joseph as a slave and deceive his father into thinking his favorite son had been slain and was now dead, killed by wild beasts. Well, Joseph is sold to a high-ranking Egyptian uh, named Potiphar and eventually becomes a supervisor of Potiphar's household. Now, if you go back a little bit again to some of the story, you would think, okay, there's some negative things going on. That, that can't be God. I mean, that's bad. I mean, his brother's hating him and being sold like that. That's all bad stuff. God, what are you doing? Most of us would ask God those questions. I don't get it. Why is this happening? So now he's in Potiphar's household, and we read how he excelled in his duties and became one of Potiphar's most trusted service, servants and was put in charge of his whole household. Oh, man, that's good. Go from bad, all of a sudden it's good. 
Well, Potiphar could see that whatever Joseph did, God looked favorably on him, and he prospered in everything he did. However, Potiphar's wife attempts to seduce Joseph. And again, although Joseph does everything right, he literally runs out of the room. Potiphar's wife lies about what happened, having grabbed his coat, hanging onto it, and said, look what Joseph did to me. He tried to rape me. Well, things reversed again for Joseph. Now he's put into prison. Uh, not like what we have today, by the way. A little bit kind of a rougher living situation. Although he's innocent, he's cast into prison. Now in prison, Joseph interprets the dream of two of the fellow prisoners in there. And both interpretations prove to be true. And one of the men is later released from jail and restored to his position as the king's cupbearer. Two years later, the king has some troubling dreams. And the cupbearer remind, remembers that Joseph has this gift of being able to interpret dreams. So the king calls for Joseph and relates his dreams. And Joseph predicts seven years a bountiful harvest are coming. Wow, that's awesome. Wouldn't you love to hear that? You're going to be blessed seven years. You're going to have so much blessing, you're not going to know what to do with it. Oh, this is awesome. Stop there, please. <laughs> Joseph doesn't stop there. He says seven years of famine are following that. And he advises the king to begin to put away enough grain storing it for those years. And for his wisdom, Joseph is now made ruler of Egypt, second only to the king. Wow, that's awesome. Now the famine strikes. Even Canaan is affected by this. And Jacob then sends 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy grain. And while they're there meeting their long lost brother, whom they do not even recognize at this point, Joseph's brothers are bowing down to him fulfilling the earlier prophecy. And Joseph then reveals his identity to his brothers. And he forgives their wrongdoing. Now Jacob and his family move to Egypt where there's, they spend 400 years there until Moses leads them out. Now how many of you would agree that there were some bad things that happened to Joseph? I mean, th that's really bad. Again, what your brothers did to you and being falsely accused and being put in prison and then being forgotten all those years, all these bad things are happening. Let's go to Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 and 20. This is what Joseph says to his brothers. He said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Just pause there for a moment. Bad things had happened to Joseph. And he says, am I in the place of God or am I not? Am I in the place of God? And he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So Joseph recognized that this bad thing and this bad thing and this bad thing were actually a part of God's plan. See, sometimes when bad things happen, again, we question God, we doubt God, we get angry at God, or we think maybe we're even out of God's will. These things that happened, many of them were things that Joseph hadn't even made the bad decision. He had done nothing wrong, and bad things kept happening. But when we look at the entire picture, we see how this is in some way a part of of God's plan, thinking, I have got to get a man of God in this position, or the entire area is going to die. And so because of that, Joseph has to go through some suffering. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. At just the age of 16 years old, St. Patrick was kidnapped by pirates and taken from his British homeland to Ireland where he was sold into slavery. Again, you're having a bad day? Pirates kidnap you, sell you into slavery? This is not a movie, friends. This is true. He worked in the fields as a shepherd for six years under terribly harsh conditions until God miraculously provided a way of escape for him to be able to flee. And as difficult as that time must have been, 
It was during those lonely years of enslavement where he was facing hunger, where he faced freezing temperatures. I know that's hard to imagine, isn't it? Freezing temperatures and a lot of pain. But it is there in that that he met God and found deep closeness to his presence through his incredible times of prayer and meditation. Who would ever have dreamed how God would turn around this tragedy for good after months back at home, recuperating and seeking direction for his future plans, St. Patrick felt strongly led to go back to Ireland. He knew God had brought him there for, the, for a purpose, and, and he was burdened to share Christ with a lost nation. And history tells us that thousands were saved. Revival broke out among this pagan people. Lives were changed as many came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. All because of some of the bad things that he had gone through, got him to the place where he could actually do incredible things for God. How many of you remember Johnny Erickson Tata? Those of you that are younger probably don't, but most of us my age or older will remember her. Uh, She has a great ministry now. But uh, there was a diving accident in 1967, and she was at the age of 17. Now, this isn't planned, but did you get how old Joseph was? How old St. Patrick was? How old Johnny Erickson Tata was? 17, 16, 18, right in that age group when all these things were happening. And she was diving into water, and she, she broke her neck, and she became a quadriplegic in a wheelchair without the use of her, of her hands at all. And, and after two years of rehabilitation, she emerged with these new skills and a fresh determination to help others in similar situations. And during her rehab time, Joni spent long months learning how to paint with her mouth. She would stick a paintbrush in there, and she would begin to make that painting with her mouth. She was determined that nothing would stop her. She didn't blame God for the bad that had happened. She began to decide, okay, this is how it's going to steer my life. I'm going to make something good out of that bad. And God was using that as well to develop in her a ministry that, that, that brought her to the forefront of being able to minister to thousands upon thousands. She writes a devotional, and I want to share a few thoughts from her devotional. She starts with John 10, verse 3 and 4. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. She says, ever get the feeling you're somewhere out in front of God as you move through your week? You bump up against a trial, and you know from Scripture that God is going to work all things together for good. But somehow you have the idea that God's behind you, armed with a dustpan and a broom, (laughs) ready to do a cleanup job on you and your problems. And I would say for some of us, God is armed with a shovel and a bucket. Right? Perhaps you imagine God standing a few paces back with a bottle of glue, ready to pick up the broken pieces of your life and paste them back together. Or do you imagine him with a hammer and nails, ready to follow you after you do a a patch-up job when things fall apart? If you feel as though God's principal activity in your life is to follow behind you and throw a rope after you've fallen headlong into a trial, then you need to memorize our verse for today. A shepherd never follows his flock. He leads the flock. Jesus himself says that he goes on ahead. He blazes a straight path and he charts the way. And never is God surprised by your trials. Oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, I should have done this before that happened. He's not surprised by it. And when it happens, he's still leading the way, plowing a way through it for you. Never does he push you out ahead and back you up with a dustpan and broom. God is out in front. Psalm 139, verse 5 and 6 says, You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Friends, he leads us. He's charting all of my days. He's planning every event that fits miraculously into a pattern of good for my life, although sometimes it doesn't always seem good because sometimes I'm only seeing the small picture of what he's doing. 
Though God is not the author of evil in the world, and though often he does choose to shelter and protect us from evil attacks from the enemy, sometimes he takes us straight through dark seasons. For some of you, 2017, it was a dark season. And there's no guaranteeing that 2018 is any better. But sometimes we shouldn't even run from those things. And we say, God, what are you doing? How are you changing my heart? How are you changing my dependency on you? What are you up to? And just yield before God and say, God, whatever you have for me, I'm yours. Whatever your plan is, I trust you completely. And begin to watch that one day you'll begin to look back and you'll say, ah, oh, this is what God was up to. This is what he was doing. I went through that so that I could now help this person because I wouldn't have any understanding of what they're going through if I hadn't gone through this situation. And God begins to turn around those things. And what the enemy meant for evil, God begins using for good. I want to share with you just a few scriptures here this morning that fit in with this before we close and move on to our water baptism. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. I don't know about you, but I love a great story where there's an underdog, where there is somebody that has had something tragic happen to them, and somehow they rise above that tragedy, and they do something miraculous. I'm like, man, that is so inspiring. That is so cool, and it kind of encourages me. How many like a story like that? How many like to be that person that goes through the trial, that goes through the hardships, that doesn't know how the end of the story is going to turn out? Most of us would go and put our hands down, wouldn't we? We love stories like that as long as it's somebody else, right? But God has a story for you. You look around this room this morning, and there are lots of stories. Oh, God has brought you through hardship through struggles. And some of you can look back and say, man, I didn't see the big picture right away, but when I saw it, boom, I had an aha moment. This is what God is doing. It's worth it all. Some of you are right now in that moment, and you're like, oh, this stinks. <laughs> can we get to the end of the story soon, God? I don't want any more chapters between now and the end of the book. Let's just get to the end. But God is doing something far beyond what you can imagine. And so again, sometimes we, we go through those seasons where we want to get rid of them and we want to run away from them and we, we want to forget them. But I would challenge you to maybe have a different perspective on the challenges of life. Say, God, what are you doing through this? Sherry, you've had a few challenges, some scary moments for you and your family. And you would maybe say, you know what, I'd rather have not gone through that. But I guarantee you, God has done a great work because of the challenge that you've gone through. Others have been touched. Others have been ministered to. And we don't sometimes know why, why me for that. But we're God's. I don't have all the answer. We're his. We are God's. I submit my life to him and say, whatever you have for me, God. And we trust him. God sees the big picture, Sherry. <laughs> and we rejoice every time you send a text. Good report, yes, yes, it's awesome. Some of you have stories like that. I don't understand why we go through what we do, but we trust him. And we don't always need to run from those bad times. Say, so God uses for you. Help me to grow, first of all. Help my faith to mature. Help me to trust in you more and more. And then, God, whatever you want, I'm yours. 
2018, we're all going to have some problems, right? We're going to have some good days like Joseph, and we're going to have some days that just tanks. But God's there. He's not surprised by it. We stay faithful, and we hang on. God's going to use those things for his glory and honor. I want to be used by God, but I don't enjoy those moments when it's going bad, when things tank. But I say, God, whatever you want, I'm yours. Whatever your 2017 looked like, I don't know. But God's got a great 2018 for you, filled with ups and downs. And through it all, we're going to stay strong, and we're going to grow, and God's going to use us, and we're not going to see the small little picture. We're going to see the big perspective. And as Joseph said to his brothers, yeah, you, you meant for harm. I forgive you. God had a purpose and a plan. Saving of many lives. May God do that through our lives this year. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands this morning on whether you're going through a trial or not because we've all got those. It's our perspective on some of those things. It's our trust in God. I don't see the picture, God, but you do. And right now, if you're going through tragedy and hardship, would you invite the Holy Spirit to come and just help you, just remind you that he's there. He hasn't left you. He doesn't abandon us in the storm. He doesn't forget about us. He's there with you right now. And some of you just need to know he's there. And you can hang on to him. In fact, he's hanging on to you. He's hanging on to you right now. Maybe there's somebody here this morning that you don't have a relationship with Jesus today. And you've been trying lots of things in life and it's just not working. Again, I don't guarantee you by giving your life to Jesus that everything becomes perfect because it doesn't. But he's there. You need a relationship with him. Your eternity is on the line based upon a relationship with Jesus Christ because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So today, if you don't know God, if you haven't come to the Father through Jesus, right now, I want to invite you to just lift up your hand real high. Lift up your hand if that's you. Anyone here this morning? Okay. I just want to pray for you. The kids are going to be getting coming in right now, so you'll hear that, and that's fine. Let me just pray for you before we move on to a water baptism. Our Heavenly Father, Through the good and the bad, we trust you. And Lord, help us to not always just run away from some of the bad things that have happened in our life. A lot of those things we'd like to forget, and it's not that we want to dwell there, but Lord, some of those things, we just need to remember that you're you're working, and you're chiseling on our hearts and changing our character and causing us to become stronger and, and bringing us to a place for such a time as this. And so although we don't embrace difficult times we know that they'll come and yet we know through you we're going to stand strong because our house is built on the rock and father i pray that through those times we would keep our eyes on you and that they would have a purpose or that we'd be able to have more compassion for others as they go through the similar things or that we'll have a different perspective or that many will even come to faith in jesus because of things that we've gone through father we love you we trust you God, I pray that there would be many incredibly inspiring stories throughout this church in this next year, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.